I guess I can introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Aaron Birch. Um, I did my PhD a long time ago at Stanford. And after that, I was in Colorado for quite some time. And then I moved to, to Germany to work at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research in 2012. And I've, I've been here since. Um, and today I'm going to talk about global helioseismology. And I wanted to say a little bit about um, the scope here. It's a big topic. And what I'm trying to do is provide an overview of the basic ideas. We don't have time to go into a whole lot of detail about anything. Um, so the experts are going to have to forgive me for, for painting some things with a pretty broad brush. Um, and I should also say that there have been some places where I've put in some older figures to point out interesting early papers, um, but I'm not, I'm not trying to do a historical review here. It's really about setting out the basic ideas. Um, so with that, I'll get started. It's a long outline, but, but don't panic. Some of these things I'll do quickly. Um, I wanted to give one slide that's really the big picture. That's the, the one slide introduction to global helioseismology. I'll talk about some motivations and a very little bit about oscillation modes of the sun. Um, I'll show some examples of input data and where those data come from. We'll talk about mode frequencies and then inversions. So this is the process of inferring things about the solar interior from the mode frequencies that we observe. And I'll show a little bit about results. So here's the, the really big picture. We can see acoustic and surface gravity modes at the solar surface. And the oscillation frequencies of these modes depend on physical conditions in the interior. For example, modes that are propagating in the direction of rotation have higher frequency than modes that are propagating in the opposite direction. And the sound speed matters for the frequencies of the acoustic modes. And different oscillation modes are sensitive to different ranges in latitude and radius. And this means that by measuring mode frequencies, not just for a few modes, but for a whole lot of modes, and I'll, and I'll show um, an example of mode coverage, by, by measuring mode frequencies for many, many modes, it's possible to map what's going on in the solar interior. Why do we want to do this? And I, I guess if you ask different people, you would get different answers. Um, but here, here are some of mine. One is that it's an opportunity to test models of solar structure and evolution. And this places constraints on a lot of uncertain physics, for example, the role of convection. And I think the next one is, is particularly exciting. It's a chance to test models of dynamics. Differential rotation of the sun is supported by Reynolds stresses and these Reynolds stresses are presumably coming from the convection. And so this is a way to place constraints on models of, of convection in a really extreme parameter regime. It's something that's just not accessible to simulations, at least not directly accessible to simulations. Um, and I think that's interesting. Another motivation is that it's a way to learn about some of the ingredients in solar dynamos. Um, for example, differential rotation plays a key role in some dynamo models, and then it winds up the poloidal field to produce the toroidal field. And the basis for this, for, for helioseismic probing is, is the oscillation modes. So I wanted to say just a little bit about that. Um, according to models, there should be three types of modes in spherically symmetric non-rotating stars. So I'm talking about much, much simpler problems than what we heard about um, in the previous lecture. There are internal gravity modes, 
I would argue these haven't been convincingly observed on the sun. Um, there are acoustic modes, these are called P modes, pressure modes, sound waves, um, and surface gravity modes. These are called F modes, and they're deep water waves, omega squared equals GK. Um, if you go through the math, you find that oscillation modes can be labeled with three quantum numbers. There's N, this is the radial order, the number of nodes in radius. L, the angular degree, it's the number of node lines on the surface. And M, the azimuthal order, the number of node lines that cross the equator. And you can write down the displacement associated with a particular mode in terms of spherical harmonics that tells you the latitude and longitude dependence of scalar quantities and also the, the radial velocity or radial displacement. And then a term that depends on this thing is a gradient on a unit sphere of a spherical harmonic. Um, so again, these, these guys are spheroidal modes. They don't have any radial vorticity. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about that. And a really, really important point for understanding heliosismology at a conceptual level is that different modes probe different parts of the sun. And you can look at that in a little more detail. Here's an equation that tells you the lower turning point. So this RT is the radius of the lower turning point. And any particular wave with a, some mode frequency, omega, and some angular degree, L, um, propagates down to this lower turning point. And you can rearrange that equation a little bit. And what it's telling you is that the horizontal phase speed of the wave is equal to the sound speed at the lower turning point. The figure on the right shows a one particular mode in this lower turning point is where you see the um, last bit of color in here. There's also a turning point in latitude and that has to do with M divided by L. So the sectoral modes, the M equals L modes are confined close to the equator and the M equals zero modes extend further in latitude. And by combining information from different modes, we'll be able to, to figure out where things are located in the solar interior. Here's a little bit more about where the waves are traveling. Um, so the P modes, the acoustic modes are trapped between the surface and the lower turning point. There's also an upper turning point, and that depends on the mode frequency, and it depends on your, how the acoustic cutoff frequency depends on height, but we don't really need it for today. The important thing is the lower turning point. And in this diagram, the magenta line here shows an example of a propagation region. And these red lines show frequencies that you get by rearranging that lower turning point equation to make a frequency. And that thing is called the lamb frequency. And these, the P modes propagate when their frequency is above the lamb frequency. This propagation diagram also has the internal gravity modes and they're propagating in a region that's set by the buoyancy frequency of this blue curve. Um, but that's really a topic for another day. I don't want to get into it here. We can look at some example eigenfunctions. These are examples of eigenfunctions of radial displacement. So if we go back a couple of slides, just to be explicit, there are these guys here. So their horizontal dependence is like a spherical harmonic, and then they have some depth dependence. And that's what we're looking at here. The horizontal the X axis is radius inside the star. The top panel is an L equals zero mode, and that guy goes all the way down to the center of the star. 
And then panel B and panel C are for modes with higher L. And as you crank up L at fixed frequency, you're decreasing the horizontal phase speed omega over L. And so you move the lower turning point up closer to the surface. And if you go in here and you count the number of zero crossings, you can find this radial order. N. Okay. So that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a theory background. But how do you actually measure anything? And so we have to talk about the input data. Um, here are some of the sources of data for global helioseismology. Um, H the HMI instrument on SDO. Um, SDO is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. HMI is a one instrument on SDO. And this has been taking data since 2010. And it takes essentially continuous observations of the sun. At, um, and it produces Doppler grams. I'll show an example in a second. Um, and explain what that is at 45 second cadence. And these images cover the full disk. The MDI instrument on the SOHO spacecraft um, also produced essentially continuous 60 second data, though at um, somewhat lower resolution. And occasionally ran campaigns at four arc second resolution. Um, MDI also had a high resolution field, but it's not, it's not so commonly used for global helioseismology. Another important source of data is the Gong network. This is a network of ground-based telescopes. There's always at least one of them looking at the sun and it produces 60 second data. And the resolution is about five arc seconds. It's also important to mention here Bison this is a network of ground-based telescopes. Um, and it provides sun as a star observations. Um, there, from 1992 on, there were six stations so in, a, in a layout similar to Gong. So there's always one looking at the sun. Um, but there are observations from Bison with fewer telescopes all the way back to 1976. So let's let's look at some Doppler grams. This is the basic basic input for helioseismology. You can do helioseismology with other things, for example, the intensity, but but Doppler is is probably the most important. Um, and so what we're looking at is an image of the sun, and in each pixel, you're looking at how quickly that particular bit of the sun is moving towards or away from the spacecraft. The, the original HMI images are 4K by 4K. But it doesn't fit on my screen. Um, this is lower resolution. And so what do you see? The main thing that your eye sees when you look at this is that there's a big gradient across the image. And this is just solar rotation. So this is plus or minus two kilometers per second. One side of the image, the sun is rotating towards us and the other side is rotating away. This splotchy pattern, it's easier to see near the limb, is the supergranulation. This is intermediate scale convection. If we take out rotation, it's a little easier to look at. Um, and again, you see supergranules as you get near the limb. They're just easier to see there. Their motion, their, their velocities, their motions are mostly horizontal. And so you get more of a projection onto the line of sight when they're off near the limb. And near disk center, you see mostly the P modes. The P modes are mostly radial motions, so they're easier to see near the disk center. Let's see if I can get the, uh, the movie to play here. This is a time series covers about an hour. We play it a few times. So that flickering pattern that you see, that's the P modes. 
mostly. And that's the, the basis for helio seismology. Okay, so how do you pull modes out of that? If you look at that pattern, you just see a kind of flickery mess. Um, so what can you do? Well, for the acoustic modes with, with big radial order, the, the radial motion dominates over the horizontal motion at the surface. The, mo the motion is mostly radial. Um, and we saw before that the pattern of radial motions for a single mode looks like a spherical harmonic. Um, there's a bit of a caveat there. The, I, talk, I was talking about a non-rotating sun, but if you put it in differential rotation, you find that the eigenfunctions and latitude change. Um, and this is a really big effect at large L, but let's leave that aside for now and keep it simple. Um, so these first two points here suggest that the way to look at the modes with a particular L and M is to project the data onto spherical harmonics. And that's what's done. So for, let's use V of theta and phi, so co-latitude and longitude, say, and time. These are your Doppler images. You can project those things onto spherical harmonics and make a time series for each L and each M. And then you can compute the Fourier transform in time and look at the power spectrum, which is what I've written here. Um, I'm gonna show figures of the power spectrum because they're nice to look at. Um, but analysis is sometimes done with just the, the amplitude spectra, the, the ALM themselves. So this is an image from the uh, special issue of science for Gong first results. I thought it would be nice to show this figure. And it shows cuts through a power spectrum at L equals 85. The regions are dark, that are dark are where the power is large. And if you look at the top panel, this is zoomed out just to show a bunch of different radial orders. The x-axis is frequency and the y-axis is azimuthal order. And so you see one of these black ridges for each radial order. If you zoom in in frequency, you see that each of those ridges is not just a simple ridge, but there's a whole bunch of fine structure in there. And the fine structure is, is mostly due to leaks from, from other angular degrees. Um, because we don't observe the whole surface of the sun, um, the spherical harmonic transform doesn't isolate modes perfectly. Plus there's the effect that I mentioned that the, that the eigenfunctions aren't exactly spherical harmonics because of differential rotation. If you zoom in even more on one of those particular ridges plus nearby leaks, you see that those curves the, the shape of these features, these excess power features or the resonances are not straight lines. And it's jumping ahead a little bit. We'll come back to this point. But the fact that those features are not straight tells you that there's differential rotation in the sun, um, that you have this, this nonlinear dependence of the frequencies on M. And we'll, we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Here's another way to look at the power spectrum. Um, to make a figure like this, you take a, something like what I showed before and correct for rotation and then sum up the power over M. And so now we have only, we had a three dimensional thing before. Power is a function of L and M and frequency. And now we're down to a two dimensional thing after we've summed out through summed out M. And the horizontal axis is L. So this is telling you the spatial scale. High L means small spatial scale. Low L means large spatial scale. And the y-axis is frequency. 
In this diagram, red means large power, and blue means small power. And there's some beautiful stuff going on here. The lowest ridge is the F mode. So this is the, the deep water wave, the omega squared equals GK. And then we have P modes with different radial orders. This first ridge is the P1 mode. So it has one node in radius. And then as you go up in this diagram, you move to P modes with more nodes in radius, so higher N. And there's convection down here at lower frequency. There's convection everywhere, but it's the amplitude is largest down here. Um, the first time I saw that, I think I had to ask three times, is, is that a model or is that data? But it's data, it's pretty amazing. So we've seen how to isolate modes and we looked at some power spectra. But how do you actually make a quantitative measurement of mode parameters out of that? And this is a thing that, that could really be a lecture by itself, um, but we don't have time for that. So I'll just go over the key steps. Um, the first step is you need a model for the power spectrum or the amplitude spectrum, whichever one it is that you're gonna fit with some free parameters. Um, typically the mode frequency, the line width of the mode, this has to do with you know, how wide is the, is the resonance in frequency, and this is connected to the lifetime of the mode. The amplitude, the background, and this, this the topic of what's the background is a little bit complicated, but some combination of contributions from other modes plus the convection. You need a model for the leakage matrix. Remember when we looked at those power spectra, we saw all of those side lobes. Those are coming from, from, yeah, from other L's and you need a model for that, um, but it's pretty well understood and you can take care of it in the fitting. And the statistics are well known. And so you can use something like maximum likelihood to figure out the, free, the values of the free parameters that give you a best fit to the observations. Um, and then the result of this process is a set of mode parameters for each mode. Here's a mode coverage figure from Jesper. Um, I don't know why the text ended up so small, but anyways, sorry Jesper. It's a beautiful figure. So this shows mode coverage from 15 years of MDI medium L observations. And the really important thing is to notice this color scale up here. Even these red guys, these are a thousand sigma error bars on the mode frequencies. And it gets even better as you go all the way down to the F modes here. Um, so we can measure these frequencies incredibly well. Um, you might wonder why things get, you know, why stop at the ends of these ridges? Um, and the dominant effect there is that the modes start to blend together. The line widths go up and they get closer together and it's hard to fit. Okay. So we've gone from Doppler grams through a spherical harmonic transform and we talked about fitting to obtain mode frequencies and mode parameters. The next step here is how do we connect models of the solar interior with the expected mode frequencies? Because at the end of the day, we don't really want only mode frequencies. We want to say something about the inside of the sun. And a key assumption here is that we're allowed to do perturbation theory. So the idea is that we can start with a reference solar model and ask ourselves the question, if I change this model a little bit, what would it do to my expected mode frequencies? Um, and this is really a wonderful simplification. Um, it allows you to do linear forward and inverse problems. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but it means you don't need to run a model each time to compute, okay, what are the frequencies from this model and say, oh, is it good or not good? And then compute a new model 
you can start from a reference model that's close and then just look at small deviations um, in that model. Which brings us to solar models. Um, yet again, a topic that could be an entire lecture, if not an entire course. Um, so I'll just give a, a very brief summary here. Um, the typical assumption is that the model is for a spherical, non-rotating and non-magnetic star. You have your conservation equations and mass, momentum, energy. You have some observational constraints on the star. For example, the age, the solar, uh, uh, constraints on the sun, sorry. The age, the solar radius, the mass and the luminosity. You have a model for the nuclear reaction rates. You need assumptions about the abundances um, the opacities, the equation of state. You need some approximations for the convective flux. Um, and in a similar way, you need approximations for whatever other microphysics you're gonna put into your model. So for example, the, how mixing is gonna work in your model. And you take all of that and you stick it in an evolutionary model and you run it until it's at the right age. And then you adjust what you need to adjust to get the solar radius and the solar mass. Um, and the end result of that process is some model for the sound speed and the density and the temperature as a function of radius inside the, inside the sun. And we'll see later that these models are, are good. And, and that's a, subject, a subjective claim there, but I'll, I'll show a little bit more about why I'm saying that later on. And then, like I said, you can linearize around the reference model. And you end up with equations that look like this, that say, if I make some little change, so the change in C squared at fixed R, and the change in the density, um, those changes result in some change in the mode frequencies. And this linear relationship is expressed through these kernel functions, K. And these, these kernels are things that just depend on the reference model and on the um, eigenfunctions of the mode you're talking about. So they're not things that you have to update every time you change, every time you think about a different delta C squared. They're fixed properties of the reference model. And so this is the forward problem. It tells you, okay, if I make a little change in C squared and a little change in rho, how does it change my, my mode of frequencies? Um, oh yeah, and I should have um, should mention a little more that there's no M in here. The assumption is that we're in a, in a spherically symmetric star and the mode of frequencies in that case don't depend on M. So that was the case of structure, but you can do a similar thing for rotation. You can also work out kernel functions. So again, some K, they depend on N, L, and M in this case, that connect the rotation rate as a function of radius and latitude with changes in mode frequencies. And again, these functions K depend on the mode eigenfunctions and, and the density of the reference model. Um, and here, to give people a bit of a feel for how inversions in heliosismology work, I wanted to show the special case where the rotation depends only on radius. And yeah, let's let's talk about a little a little bit of a toy problem. I think it will, will help for for explaining the basic idea of inversions and making them a little bit less of a, of a mystery concept. Um, so let's use a, an index i to refer to a particular mode. It's just to make the equation shorter, easier than carrying around an NLM. And let's say that this, the measurement associated with mode i is di. So this could be, for example, the difference between the observed and observed mode frequency and the mode frequency in the reference model. And again, we have, just like we've seen, we have some kernels that connect the rotation rate 
with these measurements d. And it's important to remember that whenever we're trying to interpret data, you always have to remember that there's noise hanging around too. And let's say we want to make a linear inversion. So we want to get some estimate, omega tilde, of the rotation rate at some target depth. And it's a linear inversion, so we say, okay, it's going to be some linear combination of the measurements. And these weights we'll call CI. And the inversion problem is, okay, how do we choose the CI so that omega tilde is a good estimate for omega? And there are two general classes of inversions. Um, there are RLS methods, so regularized least squares. And here the idea is that we're going to choose a model. So again, a model for the rotation rate is a function of the radius, so that the model frequencies are close to the observed frequencies. And if you try doing that, um, and you just go for it, you essentially always find that you get a model that's total nonsense. And the reason is that the models have, will have big fluctuations because they're trying to match every little bump and wiggle that comes from noise in the observations. And so you find that you have to add some kind of penalty term to give the, to make the models somehow nice. And that's a subjective thing. Um, for example, you might want your model to not have very large values, or you might want the model to be smooth, or you might want the model um, to have a small second derivative. Um, there are options. Another class of methods are optimally localized averages. These are OLA methods. And here you choose these weights CI by trying to make sure that you're generating local, you know, well-localized estimates of the rotation rate and also controlling the noise level at the same time. And I'll show just a little bit about this over the next slides. Um, so if you take the equations I've shown so far and you stir them together, so remember that this omega tilde was a linear combination of the data, and those data depended in a linear way on the true rotation rate through the kernel functions. You put those together and you find that omega tilde is related to the true omega through this average in kernel kappa. And this is a thing um, that's just, again, a linear combination of the kernel functions. And the idea of OLA is saying, hey, look, if we choose this averaging kernel so that it looks like, say, a delta function at r minus rt, then we've got a nice estimate. Um, and the, the, the art form here is figuring out what are the meanings of well localized and too noisy that are appropriate for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, one particular subset of OLA methods is SOLA. It's called subtractive optimized local averages. And they gave a prescription for figuring out what these C coefficients should be. Um, and they say, well, you know, you have some target function that you decide based on what you think is good for the, for the particular problem you're doing. Try to make an averaging kernel that's close to the target function. And then you add this penalty term, this lambda is the noise covariance. You add some penalty term that is proportional to the noise estimate on your result. And then by changing this mu, you can say, you know, try really hard to match the target function, or don't worry so much about the target function, just give me an estimate without too much noise. So that is SOLA. And a little bit by way of summary here. Um, so I've showed the, the simple case of 1D inversions for one unknown quantity with no surface term. We'll, we'll come to the surface term in a minute. Um, 
And there are all kinds of generalizations of this. Um, for example, there are 2D inversions. So trying to recover rotation as a function of latitude and radius. And I'll show an example in a minute. Um, there are 1D inversions for two quantities at the same time. So for example, you want to infer both the sound speed and the density um, simultaneously. And then maybe you want to take care of the surface term at the same time. So that's what I wanted to show for methods. Now let's move on to results. Um, I mentioned the surface term a couple of times, but here I wanted to show an example. Um, so if you take the mode frequencies predicted from a good solar model, and you subtract them from the mode frequencies on the sun, well, the difference isn't zero. And if you scale them, these frequency differences, delta mu, scale them with this factor called a mode mass. Um, you find that everything collapses onto one curve. So these mode mass times delta nu is just a function of the mode frequency. I should explain, explain a little bit about the mode mass. The mode mass is, is the ratio of the kinetic energy in the mode to some average of v squared um, near the surface, so at the observation height, typically. Um, and if you, if you stare at the equations a little bit, you can convince yourself that you expect this scaling. So you expect a frequency shift proportional to the inverse mode mass. If you've got a little change in the physics in the near surface layers, so this particular scaling, the fact that all of these frequency differences collapse down to a single curve that's only a function of frequency, doesn't depend on L anymore. It tells you that the mismatch between the sun and the reference model is happening at the surface. Um, and presumably the, the culprit here is interaction of waves with convection. There's also, um, the fact that the waves are, are not a, a non adiabatic. Um, but in any case, it's unmodeled physics near the surface. Um, this problem isn't so horrible for the sun. We have lots and lots and lots of modes, and you can fit and remove this effect. But it's a bigger problem for astro-seismology, where you're dealing with much smaller number of modes. So it's important to make some progress on modeling this, and, and lots of people are working on it. So I think this is the only slide in my talk with two exclamation marks, and I think it deserves it. Um, so if you go through that process that I talked about, and you ask for what is the change in my solar model that takes me, a change in my reference model that, that makes the mode frequencies a good match for the observations? This is what you find. This is an inversion for the sound speed. So the y-axis here is the change in c squared divided by the reference c squared. And the blue curve is where you start from mode frequencies measured from this particular mode set. So this is 13 years of observations from bison. This is what you find. And the first thing to notice here is just the scale on the y-axis. In some absolute sense, you're dealing with a very small number. The error in the reference model is tiny. Um, and so from that, you would say, okay, models are doing a really great job at, at predicting solar structure. That's great. And then you look at it a little more and you realize that these differences between what's happening in the sun and what's happening in the reference model are just enormous compared to the errors in the helioseismic inferences. Um, we're dealing with a whole lot of sigmas here. And you have this big bump at the base of the convection zone. Um, and things aren't going so well near the surface. Um, 
And so this is telling you that there's some there's some missing physics here at the base of the convection zone and near the surface. And and so that's pretty interesting. It means that there's still things to learn, which is great. Um, this is for some particular reference model. I don't want to get too much into the detail. Um, but there have been a lot of questions about uh, solar abundances. And if you, if you make other choices for the abundances in your reference model, you can find um, differences in the sound speed that are somewhat bigger than are shown here. Um, but that's, yeah, it's another topic for another day. But just a word of caution that this, this figure is for one particular reference model. Another thing that's interesting is that the mode frequencies depend on time. And in particular, they depend on where you are in the solar cycle. Here's one particular example. So it's showing frequency shifts. So these are frequencies averaged over some set of modes observed from seen in the Bison observation as a function of time. And if you plotted, say, sunspot number, you would see something that didn't look too different from this blue curve here. Blue curve shows average of all of the modes. The black curve is for modes on the, the lower end of the frequency range, and the red is for the higher frequencies. And so you see that the, that the frequency shift depends on frequency. And if you look at that in a little more detail, what you find is again, this mode mass scaling. So it's saying that whatever it is that's causing these solar cycle dependencies in the mode frequencies, it's something near the surface, or at least it's dominant when it's something near the surface. And you can also ask which latitudes are responsible. This is a figure from the Lebrecht and, and Woodard paper, which is one of the first on this topic. And they ask, if we look at these solar cycle changes in mode frequencies and do an inversion for a thing that's, that behaves as a sound speed, they're not arguing it's actually a sound speed, but a thing that behaves as a sound speed, you find these curves, the solid curves, and they compare to some measurements of where activity is and latitude and you get the squares. And the agreement's pretty good. And it says that it's the active latitudes that are responsible for the solar cycle um, dependence on the frequencies, or at least mostly responsible. Another result I wanted to show is the map of differential rotation in the sun. Um, the measurement of differential rotation in the interior is I think one of the, one of the big accomplishments in Julius cosmology. Um, this particular one is from six years of HMI observation. Um, so we're looking here just at a, at a meridional cut, and the color is telling you the rotation rate. So you have in the, in the convection zone, you have fast rotation at low latitudes, and the rotation rate decreases as you go to higher latitudes. In the radiative interior, you have essentially uniform rotation. Um, Matt mentioned this in his lecture, but the, um, the rotation rate is not constant on cylinders, so we don't have the, the Taylor Feldman balance. Um, it's also worth noting that there's sharp gradients in rotation near the base of the convection zone. Um, this is called the tackle climb. And there are also sharp gradients in rotation near the surface. This is called the near surface shear layer. Like with mode frequencies, the rotation rate changes with the solar cycle. And this is one, one recent figure. So what we're looking at are these bands. Red means fast and the green blue means slow. Bands are faster and slower rotation that are moving towards the equator as the cycle progresses. These white contours are showing where there's activity. 
Um, and there are interesting things happening at high latitudes also. Um, I don't want to say too much about it. We'll come back to it a bit in the, in the local helioseismology lecture. And these, these torsional oscillations, these time dependent zonal flows depend on depth. Um, they extend really through the convection zone. So this is a, a time series of one year averages of these rotation rates. Um, and so it's, it's not just a surface phenomenon, but it's something that, that fills the convection zone. So by way of summary, um, we've seen that global mode frequencies are measured from time series of Doppler grams. And the mode frequencies tell us about solar structure and about differential rotation. Um, inversions of the mode frequencies give us information about, about solar structure. It says that the reference models are really pretty good in the, in the absolute sense. Um, but at the same time, at a, at a high level of significance, they're not compatible with the observations. And so there's more to learn here. Um, we saw that the convection zone rotates differentially in latitude and radius. And we talked a little bit about solar cycle variations. So that's what I wanted to say for today. Thank you, everyone.